other side as they know their streets. Hello and welcome to today's Aquarium at Home live stream and happy birthday to us. It is our 28th birthday here at the Tennessee Aquarium. We opened on May 1st, 1992 and to celebrate that momentous occasion, we are here in our red rough side of the lemur forest exhibit on the top floor of Ocean Journey and I am joined by Maggie Seip. Hello everyone. So these are our two red rough lemurs. This is our male avior right here and our female Josephine. Today is a little birthday treat to celebrate the aquarium turning 28. We thought we would give them a little snack as well. And these, this is just frozen oatmeal and it has some peach jelly in it to flavor it. And I think Avior swallowed the first one whole, so I'm not handing him a second one just yet. Um, but we are very excited to share our birthday with you guys at home. And a fun fact about these guys is their birthday is also in May. So these guys will be turning, he'll be turning 12 at the end of the month. And Miss Josephine will be turning 19 at the end of the month. So they kind of share their birthday month with the aquarium. And I'm going to go ahead and set this one over here for him. So it's a triple birthday threat then here at the Tennessee yes. Aquarium at the moment. And you are seeing one of the really cool, well you were for a moment, one of the cool adaptations that separates uh, or distinguishes the red rough lemurs from our other species of lemurs, the red, the, the ringtail lemurs who also can now apparently do it. Yes, ringtail lemurs can also hang upside down uh, from their back feet. So most lemurs kind of have this ability, at least our ringtails and these guys do. Um, you see it more from these guys though. These guys rely on that behavior a lot to reach the fruits and flowers that grow at the ends of those more delicate branches out in the rainforest. So that behavior is really important for these guys. Um, and it's, the ringtails can do it as well, but you don't see it quite as often. Aha. Uh -huh. So as you're watching this, undoubtedly you will have questions like, why did the presenter not know that both kinds of lemurs can hang upside down from their feet? Feel free to type those into the comments and I'll pass them on, even if they are embarrassing to me. <laughs> Uh, so far, we're getting a lot of happy birthday uh, wishes, including from Keith Sanford, who is our president and CEO. Thank you very much, Keith, for that. those well wishes. We obviously are very pleased to be celebrating our 28th anniversary or birthday, however you would like to describe it today, and to be celebrating these two really beautiful lemurs who are Avior and Josephine, as Maggie was saying earlier. So, Maggie, where did these guys come from? So, lemurs come all the way from which is a small island off the coast of Africa. And it is the only place in the world that you can actually find lemurs. So it's a really special place. It actually has a lot of species that can only be found there. So it's very, very important for biodiversity and is what's known as a biodiversity hotspot. And another word for what Maggie just said, if this is your science hour for the day, if you happen to be at home, uh, would be endemism. So that is when you can only find a species in a certain place and nowhere else. That is an endemic species. So that's a good science vocabulary word for the day. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please type them down in the comments and I promise I will pass them on to Maggie. But uh, in the meantime, we can talk a little bit about some of these cool decorations that you have put up. We should talk a bit about the fact that when we do things like this, all of these decorations are approved to be used in the exhibit, right? Yes, all of these decorations are very eco-friendly and safe for our lemurs. So I just have balloons made out of construction paper, like you probably have laying around at home if you have kids. And I used streamers to make the ribbons from those balloons. And then I put them together using just a little bit of flour mixed with water, which is what we call flour paste. And we use that for a lot of things here when we do enrichment. Flower paste helps us wrap presents when if you ever see the lemurs with gifts around Christmas time, it helps us make them a lot of fun stuff and makes it a little challenging for them to open. So it's all very safe and this is a very good eco-friendly alternative to balloons, just the paper balloons here. So we're getting a few questions that are coming in, uh, including uh, from Amanda Johnson, who wants to know what do they eat? And someone earlier, I'm gonna have to scroll up in the comments, wanted to know, oh, Jennifer Demond would like to know how do they normally find their food? So what do they normally eat and how do they normally find their food? So those are really good questions. These guys in particular are mostly frugivores, which means they eat mostly fruits or nectars from flowers. They have these long snouts, as you can see on Avior here, that allows them to get deep into flowers for looking out nectar. And they even have really long tongues that allow them for that to do that as well. So they do drink a lot of nectar and that's a 
fun fact, it actually, because of that behavior, allows them to be one of the world's largest pollinators. So that's really unique for these guys and a pretty cool fact about them. Um, so they eat mostly whatever fruits they can find. They do eat some vegetation as well, some green leaves and stuff, but they really prefer those fruits and nectars out in the wild. Now here at the aquarium, they do eat mostly fresh fruits and veggies is what they eat here. Mostly veggies, because our veggies have a similar sugar content to native fruits in Madagascar. So we like to make sure that they're not getting too much sugar because that can be really bad for these guys. So we're getting a lot more uh, happy birthdays in. I kind of expected that. So I'm not gonna pass all of them on, but just know that Josephine and Avior appreciate your well wishes as does the entire Tennessee aquarium community. So. Uh, Stephanie Raymond, uh, probably mispronounced that. I should go ahead and preface this by saying I'm going to undoubtedly mispronounce a lot of names in the course of this live stream, as I usually do. But Stephanie uh, Raymond would like to know, what is their favorite enrichment? Their favorite enrichment? Uh, these guys are actually pretty hard to please. Like, our ringtail lemurs are very high energy, and they bounce around a lot, whereas Josephine and Avior kind of could care less about most things unless it's food. So you can see right now she's chewing on one of those ice treats kind of been holding it in her mouth, letting it melt. But um, so unless it's food, they don't really seem to care much. They do like plain paper. Actually, they love to scent mark paper. So I'd say for these guys, that's probably about the only two things they really enjoy when it comes to enrichment. Um, other than that, they find it annoying when we make it more challenging for them to get to their food most of the time. So uh, for those of you who are joining who maybe are unfamiliar with the notion of enrichment and what enrichment happens to, to mean or what it, what it entails, can you give us a bit of a primer on what enrichment is? Absolutely. Enrichment is a super important part of what we do to help take care of our animals here at the aquarium. We make sure that every day is a little bit different from the day before it by providing enrichment. It keeps their brains working, hopefully a little bit, helps them like, hone those problem solving skills and it's really important to get them moving around as well. So sometimes enrichment can just be putting food all over the exhibit, so they actually have to move all over the exhibit. I know if I were an animal and I didn't have to work for my food, I would get pretty lazy about it. So we just make sure that they're always active and they always have something to do. It's very important, especially for these guys, since they are primates, it is required that they get two different kinds of enrichment every day. So you're seeing the paper balloons, which is one enrichment that we did this morning for them. So those have been up all day. And then they also got the ice treat, which is something that's very rare for them. So that was very exciting for them. Now you just said that they're primates. Does that make them monkeys? They are not monkeys. No, they are primates. Josephine's finally coming to join us and see if there's any more food. But they are kind of the lowest form of primates. So while we're here at the very top of the primate spectrum, lemurs are all the way down at the bottom. And these guys are actually really, really unique even within the primate world. They are one of the only primates to have litters of offspring. Most primates actually have one to two offspring, especially lemurs have one to two offspring at a time, and keep the baby on mom. I'm glad that I moved. These guys will actually have build a nest and leave their offspring in the nest, and they can have anywhere from three to six. Now, I apologize if uh, the view is a little bit dark. I might try and rotate a little bit because we're a little bit backlit, but uh, these are excellent questions coming in. And Jennifer DeMond says, thank you so much. You made Jordan's day answering her question. So you just gave somebody else a birthday present on our birthday. Awesome. How kind of you. Happy birthday to you as well. Ashley King Cheros, who is a frequent stream, stream watcher, wants to know how many fingers do lemurs have? Lemurs have 10 fingers on their hands and 10 toes as well, just like us. They are very unique. You can see Avior's fingers there. Uh, their hands are quite big compared to their body size. So that is something that's really cool about them. It gives them that really strong grip and allows them to climb a lot better than we can. They also have extra thick skin on their fingers and toes. That's another difference from us. That also gives them a better grip. It's not their fingernails that help them climb or grip. It's the extra skin they have on their fingers. Uh, JC Maldondo. Maldonado? Maldonado, probably. Sorry about that. I uh, would like to know, who is the picky one of the two of them? Um, it's Josephine for the most part, but really she surprises us a lot. So when we give enrichment, sometimes we give foods they don't always get, like asparagus or matzo crackers, things like that. And everyone else seems to ignore them, but Josephine will like those. But Avior kind of is the least dominant here, so really goes around and just kind of cleans up everything behind her. 
Yeah, we should talk a little bit about uh, their society. So in a lemur community, that's not unusual at all for the, the male to be subservient. We got a donation. Thank you very much for the donation. As uh, some of you may have noticed, we do have a donate button on this live stream that directly contributes to our emergency operations fund, which is of vital importance at the moment, given the fact that we can't have any of you wonderful people here visiting us and helping us to defray some of the cost of continuing to care for these beautiful animals like Josephine and Avior. So thank you very much for that donation. That will be very useful and will be going towards the very important cause of continuing to care for the animals and to pay staff like Maggie and myself, I suppose, for continuing to be here and, and doing the work that they do. Oh, so JC Maldonado also wants to know who's the playful one. So we probably should talk a little bit about the fact that lemurs in general, uh, playful though they might be, are having a pretty hard time out in the wild. Yeah, they are. They are actually known as one of the world's most endangered group of mammals. It's thought that in as little as 30 years, we could actually completely lose lemurs. And that's really, in the grand scheme of things, 30 years isn't that far away. There are over 100 different species of lemurs, and about 96% of those species are critically endangered. So it is actually rough going for lemurs out there in the wild. Madagascar is unfortunately a small place, and once all that habitat is gone, that's it. A lot of people ask us, why can't we just introduce them into the mainland, Africa, and that creates a whole other host of problems. So they really only have Madagascar, and we really have to protect it to protect these guys. Well, and as you were saying earlier, uh, being endemic to Madagascar found only in Madagascar means they've very specifically adapted to that place. I'm sure that probably has something to do with not introducing them to Africa. That is correct. So they thrive in Madagascar because they are kind of the rulers of Madagascar. There's, they show the most diversity there and they've really evolved to fill all those niches or all those places within the habitat that can be filled. There's not a ton of natural big predators, right? On the mainland of, of Africa, there would be a whole host of other predators that could really threaten them, or they could outcompete other animals that live on the mainland as well. So really it's important to protect what they have. Okay, uh, Don Gallagher would like to know, are any of these lemurs born at the Tennessee Aquarium? None of these lemurs were born here. We have only had lemurs for about three years. So Josephine and Avior came to us from the South Carolina Aquarium but they were born in zoos, so they were both born at other institutions and then came here to live out the rest of their life, and we're very happy to have them. So for those of you who are watching, I would really love to see some questions from some younger viewers. If you have any children who are watching, if you can have them dream up a question that they would love to know some more about, whether it's about primates or about lemurs or about what it's like to work at an aquarium, I would love to pass that on to Maggie, who I'm sure would be equally excited to answer it. In the meantime, we do actually have quite a few questions uh, coming through. Lots more birthday love for the lemurs, uh, more love for us as well. We appreciate all of that. A couple more donations. You all are super generous. We even told you don't bring gifts, but we will accept donations. Thank you very much for that. Amelia from Udawa, from Udawa wants to know what they like to eat best. And this is uh, being asked by Kelly Fogg. So that's a very good question. So their favorite snack of all time is probably grapes or banana. They don't get a ton of that because it is high in sugar for them, but it is definitely one of their favorite snacks to have. Okay. The things they don't like so much are zucchini. Well, as not a fan of zucchini myself, I will just go ahead and agree with them on that point. I mean, understandable. I would also wait till the grapes came out, so I don't, 
Don't blame them for leaving that behind most of the time. Uh, Christine Weigand, probably mispronounced that. Uh, Matt and Josh want to know if they like to dance like in the movie Madagascar. So they do not um, like to dance, but they do have some pretty cool moves. They are actually able to jump over five feet in height, which is really impressive. And as you saw earlier, if you were watching from the beginning, you can see them hang upside down. So while they don't like to dance necessarily, they have some pretty cool moves that they do. It is awfully fun to watch the lemurs just how acrobatic they are, whether they are they live primarily up in the trees or arboreal, yes. like the red ruffs, or if they're a little more terrestrial, like our ringtails that are over. You can just barely see the other side of the exhibit. We're, like I said, on the rainforest side of this exhibit, but you might notice that there's a little bit of interaction going on through our, I'm not sure what we call that, our flyway or? Uh, mesh, the mesh between the exhibits uh, on the bridge. Uh, so we actually have some guys out there who aren't I thought I should address it since it is going on pretty much yes. right in the background. Uh, Jacob Medina would like to know what background do what background do zoos look for in employees? That is apparently a dream job of his. It's a very good question. So I went to college and I got my degree in zoology. Um, a lot of other degrees work for this as well as far as like biology or a lot of the other environmental sciences, things like that are good backgrounds to have. But one of the biggest things you can do is start volunteering at a place like this early on. Check out the volunteer opportunities. You can also uh, start applying for internships as soon as you have a little bit of experience. And then you kind of just work your way up. But I'd say definitely look into those science programs and getting in early through volunteering is very important. Well, and as I usually uh, add when this question comes up, as it usually does during these live streams, you can actually work at a zoo or an aquarium and not necessarily have a background in science. I mean, the zoo, zoos and aquariums are a little bit like their own communities. And so like every community, there are a lot of different roles to fill. And so for instance, I have a background in journalism and my job is also at the aquarium. So if you have a passion for animals, I think that that is pretty important, kind of no matter whether you're in, in the science field of it or if you're coming at it from more of a marketing aspect or like I am. So there are definitely a lot of ways to get into it, but, but Maggie definitely gave a great response for how to actually work with the animals. But that's a very good point. We need people who help us earn money. We need people to welcome guests every day. So even if you just come here and the person who takes your ticket, they're a very important part of our aquarium and we cannot wait to have them all back here with us and we miss them all terribly. So Morgan Joe Richardson asked the question that I was hoping somebody would ask because I always wonder, how can you tell them apart? This is a very good question. So um, the red ruffs look a lot alike to a lot of people and when he was right here, it was a great opportunity to show you his main difference. He has a white stripe across his back toes on both feet, which is a really easy way to have people tell them apart. Whereas she only has like a white dot on the back of one of her feet. So I can tell them apart by looking at their faces. Her eyes are a little bit of a different color than his. She's got a little bit more of an older looking face than he does. But the easiest one is he has a stripe of white across his back toes. Now you also come to us from another institution where you worked with lemurs before. So this isn't your first rodeo working with lemurs, this am I right? Is not my first rodeo. I actually set out to be an elephant keeper and then at my first internship worked with lemurs and fell in love with lemurs. So from there I worked with lemurs mostly of that summer and then when I went to my first zoo job I got to work with lemurs a little bit off and on. Well, I continued to learn as much about them as I possibly could until I could come here and really focus on lemurs and lemur care. And it's been amazing dream come true to get to work with these guys every day. Now, what do you enjoy most about working with lemurs? I think with lemurs, it's really, they have great problem solving skills, but they're not as scary as some other primates can be personally, like some of the bigger primates can be pretty intimidating to work with and have very strong personalities. These guys are just so special and so unique and also so endangered that I really enjoy sharing their story with everyone. Avior's got an amazing little face here and it's hard not to care about them when you meet them. So I think it's really important to share their story with the world and that's one of the reasons I wanted to work with them so much. 
that's a good spot to see the white stripe across his back toes too. Oh, there it is. Yep. I will say to those of you who would want to work at a zoo or aquarium, there is definitely some, there are definitely some smells involved. Uh, they have been active, <laughs> as you might have noticed on the live stream, and the smell is potent. These guys, uh, this is one of the main reasons I tell people you definitely don't want lemurs as a pet. These guys are stinky. So they are primates. So they have poop just like primates do, and it is smelly, and it's messy, and they don't, they can't be potty trained. They just go wherever they want. So... <laughs> It's gross. It might be a dream job. That does not always make it a glamorous job. Nope. Uh, Chris <laughs> Christy Heron would like to know, are they a breeding pair? So we would love for them to have babies. They are allowed to mate if they would like. She's not on birth control or anything, but she's never shown much interest in that. She's 19 now. She's never had babies before. And so it might never happen for these two. It would be a dream come true for me if it did to have little baby red rough lemurs, but I can't fault her for not wanting babies. Her life is pretty glamorous right now. And having to take care of some little ones would be a lot more stressful for her. I'm sure many parents out there can probably echo that sentiment. Yep. So we just let her do her. If that's what she chooses for life, that is her choice. Uh, Heather Talent asks, uh, and you kind of already covered it, is it fun to work with the animals? It is really fun, but I also do take my job very seriously. So while today I got to make paper balloons and decorate for a birthday party for them, which was really fun, it also is very important to make sure I take it seriously. I have to know the ins and outs of every lemur's personality so that the second something is wrong with them, they can't tell me, so I have to be able to figure it out. So while it's fun, it can be very stressful if something goes wrong. It can be very stressful to make sure you're giving the best care that you can give. So Jehalen probably mispronounce it again. I already preemptively apologize. So Jehalen Collins uh, from Cleveland, I'm not sure if that's Tennessee or Ohio, would like to know how do primates hang from their tail? So most primates can hang from their tail, most monkeys, because they have what is called a prehensile tail. So that means they have specific muscles in their tail that they can hang from. However, lemurs cannot hang from their tails. So they have those big fluffy tails, but they don't have prehensile tails. So they cannot grab onto things with those tails. Those tails are simply there for communication purposes and balance, most importantly. So as they're moving through the trees, walking on those fine moving branches and vines, they have to have something to help them balance. When we walk across the balance beam, we kind of throw our arms out and move back and forth. A lemur's tail is built in to do that for them. Now, when you say communication, how do they use their tails for communication? For example, ringtail lemurs will use their tails for stink fighting. So that's a very important form of communication. We oh, can you pantomime stink fighting? That would just be great. <laughs> that's that. Um, so what they do is they, they rub their tails with the scent glands on their wrist, and then they'll wave them over their heads. And it's very odd behavior to watch, but it's very cute. They also, when our red rough lemurs start alarm calling, they will also whip their tails around a little bit. So it's interesting to see. We don't know if that's any kind of flagging behavior or anything like that. We can't say for sure, but we do believe that there is some communication purposes behind those tails. And now if you wonder whether the red roughs have done their alarm call during the course of this live stream, trust me, you would know. And they have not. <laughs> they have not yet. Red and rough lemurs have one volume and it is loud, very loud. So they haven't done it yet. They did it right before our live stream, actually, so you guys just missed it. But I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again before this is over. It is a little odd they haven't because one of the triggers uh, is the, the voice of men. They don't like the voice of men. Usually, like especially our curator, Kevin, always sets a viewer off for some reason. And then our security and maintenance people on the radio, they hate the sound of the, our radios that we use to communicate to each other. So for things like this, I don't have one on me so that they don't get upset. <laughs> Uh, Lou Everman, who is also a frequent commenter, uh, would like to know, are there any other types of primates on Madagascar? There you go. Right on cue. You get to see some of that tail flicking that I talked about while they were alarm calling as well. 
Uh, you would be forgiven for not remembering the question I asked yes. right before all of that cacophony sounded. But uh, Lou Everman, who would like to know, are there any other types of primates on Madagascar? Nope. Lemurs are the primates on Madagascar, and um, they are a wide range of primates, the lemur group. So they range in size from about the size of my pinky finger, that's the Madame Burst's uh, mouse lemur, which is one of the, small, the smallest primate in the world, I believe, and then the Indri lemur, which is about waist high on me. So. That's pretty tall. They range in size pretty, pretty large. Okay. Uh, Nancy Everhart says, my son Graham wants to know what age you can start working at the aquarium. Um, I do not know the exact answer for that when it comes to guest service and stuff, but for the most part, for animal related jobs, we do look for people who have a little bit of experience. I think you at least have to be 18 before you can get in here for that. Uh, Morgan Joe Richardson says, John wants to know if they nurse their babies like like mommy does, I'm not sure. I guess that, that must be Morgan Joe, but I uh, would like to know if they nurse their babies. Absolutely, so these guys, like I said, are primates. So they are just like us when it comes to birth and care. So most of the lemur species will have one to two babies, as I said. Baby clings to mom, but then nurses just like human babies do. Whereas these guys are one of only two primate species in the world, I believe, that build nests and leave their infants in the nest and then come back to nurse them individually. Now, if you're joining us late, I'm trying to think of things that you might want to know uh, about today's live stream. It is our birthday. It is the 28th birthday of the Tennessee Aquarium, and later this month, it will be the birthday also of our Red Ruff Lemurs, Avior and Josephine, and I am looking at Avior because he's got those white stripes on the back of his feet. I'll try and remember that in the future. That's going to be a good way to tell them apart. It is. So now only has, um, so they have very large canine teeth that hang out the bottom of, of the top of their mouth. You can see it from this side. Um, and he has one canine tooth that pops out of his mouth and the other one does not. So that's a good way to tell them apart as well. All right. Uh, so Amanda Johnson, who I think this actually is coming from Emma. Emma Johnson wants to know how old are they? Very good question. So Avior is currently 11 and Josephine is 18 years old. But as we said earlier, they're turning, they have their birthdays at the end of the month, so he'll be 12 and she'll be 19. Lemurs in the wild would live anywhere mid to late teens, so about 15, maybe to 18, 19 would be about the end of that range. But here at the aquarium, they can actually almost double that lifespan, and they could live well into 30 or above here in our care. And there are good reasons for that. I mean, when. There, I mean, there's many reasons for that. One is they have very healthy diets that we limit their sugar and their excess food intake. They always have that food and know where that food is coming from. That's really important for lemurs. Uh, out in the wild, sometimes food can be scarce, whereas for these guys, they never miss a meal. They always have it coming for them. They also have vet care here. So we do things like routine physicals and checkups. We can do fecals if something's wrong, or they get really good uh, dental care as well. So all those things really, length and a lifespan of an animal. So Jessica Cullen says Jehalen uh, also, and I'm again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not, but wants to know uh, why their fur is reddish. That's a good question. That is a very good question. It is very unique to these guys. Uh, most lemurs in Madagascar are small and brown. Now as to the exact reason it's red, I can't quite tell you, but it is good sort of camouflage. The counter shading, their bellies are black. The tops are a lighter color. That's what's known as counter shading in the animal world. So animals from below will look up and as they're in the trees, they'll just see the black. So they should blend in with the trees very well that way. And if anything's looking down, they'll kind of blend in that way as well. Uh, again, another example of that would probably be penguins, I guess. Penguins, exactly. Penguins are a perfect example of counter shading. Our sharks also have the lighter underbelly. Uh, Jacob Medina says, I've been keeping freshwater aquariums and starting a Paludarium? I'm not sure I even know what that word is, but uh, uh, he says, I love nature and love what you guys do. Thank you very much for, for watching and thank you for for sharing your love of, of our videos. We are very happy to be doing them. We're happy to be sharing you know, our, our animal ambassadors with you. It's obviously important to us that uh, you remember that they exist because when the time comes, we'd love for you to come back and see them. And in the meantime, it looks like some of you again have donated, which is wonderful. That's and an, great. <laughs> and, an, and an excellent contribution to our emergency operations fund, which again is how we're making sure that 
the lights are on and that everybody's taken care of and helping us kind of withstand the financial strain of having to stay closed uh, during the current health crisis. So thank you very much for that again. Amanda Flat says she's just tuning in, but five-year-old Miles would like to know where these lemurs are from. So these guys specifically, so all lemurs are found on Madagascar in, on that small island off of Africa. It's actually quite a large island, but for, compared to Africa, it's a little small. And these guys are found more in the northern rainforest area of Madagascar. So Madagascar, like I said, while it's a small island, is actually for an island quite large and has quite a range of habitats. So these guys are found more at the rainy north end in those rainforest areas, as opposed to our ringtail lemurs, which are found more in the south in the kind, kind of dry, spiny areas. Uh, Nicolette Knutson uh, would like to know what's your favorite animal to work with. So now you have to, in earshot of our red ruffs, say whether you like them or the ringtails better. I really like the red ruffs. So and I don't just say that. Like I've worked with ringtails for a long time, and they are a little bit more prevalent in zoos and aquariums. They definitely are a little more charismatic, a lot more high energy. But the red ruffs are just really special to me, especially our boy Avior. Like you're not supposed to have favorites, but he is. He is really special, very charismatic, just such a sweetheart, easy to work with, and he's a people pleaser when it comes to training. He likes to participate every time, so it just makes him a joy to work with. But our tortoises are also really fantastic, so. Now, Karen S. says, uh, says that Kirby would like to know where lemurs, where lemurs get their names from, both their lemur name and their people name. Oh, interesting. So, uh, the name lemur actually means ghost of the forest in Malagasy, so you heard those calls earlier if you were watching earlier those loud sounds so they can sound pretty spooky at night if they're calling and if you didn't know what those were so people used to be pretty spooked out by them so those sounds kind of mean ghosts of the forest now the red rough lemur gets the name red rough because they have that bright red fur which is very charismatic for them and uh josephine and adier got their name from other keepers when they were born so one of the joys of being a keeper and working at an aquarium or a zoo is when there is that offspring and maybe you get to name them or maybe a donor gets to name them. But Avior probably has a little bit more of a unique name. Josephine has a very cute, appropriate name for herself as well. Not sure where they come from. All right, uh, Morgan Joe Richardson says that two-year-old John, this is an excellent two-year-old question, and I probably would have thought the same thing, wants to know if they take baths. So these guys have a lot of special adaptations for grooming, so they don't take traditional baths like we do. They kind of groom themselves more like a cat does. So all of their bottom teeth are actually kind of fused into a specialized structure called a tooth comb. It's very entertaining if you can look at a picture of it. It looks exactly like a comb, it's just built in their mouth. So it's a specialized structure they've developed over time that helps them comb all the stuff out of their fur. And then they actually have a secondary tongue underneath their main tongue that helps them clean out that tooth comb. So that's another really wild fact about lemurs. And then they have what's known as a toilet claw, which is just one claw that grows long enough so that they can scratch stuff out of their fur or maybe clean out their ears, things like that. So they are very good social groomers, which means they like to groom each other, they groom themselves, or like they spend a lot of time grooming. So it is a very important social bonding thing for them as well. All right, uh, Christy Heron says, what is it about lemurs that makes them primates? Uh, so that's a good question. So I can't exactly tell you a very clear cut answer. I just know that they are in that primate tree. They have the opposable thumbs like we do, which gives them a primate quality. Um, and then they have the, the fur like uh, other mammals do, but I'd have to say it's probably comes from the opposable thumb type thing. Uh, Daniel Williams says that eight-year-old Logan from Murfreesboro asks, how long do they live? Good question. In the wild, mid to late teens would be about their lifespan. But here at the aquarium, as I touched on a little bit earlier, they can live much longer with us thanks to our amazing vet care and strict diets that help keep them healthy. Okay. <laughs> All right, moving down the rest of these questions. Uh, let's see. More happy birthday wishes. Again, this is our birthday. And what are we Sorry, just what he just did is a scent marking behavior. So they also have scent glands in their chest. So he just rubbed his chest on that rock to mark it as his territory. Scent is very important to these lemurs. 
Uh, they actually have a way better sense of smell than us humans do. So they communicate through that scent. So he has scent glands here, and you'll see him walking all over the exhibit, rubbing his chest on things. And that is how he's marking his territory to let others know it is his space. All right. Uh, Jacob Medina wants to know, do you guys keep native fish or display fish from different places? And we have fish from all, literally all over the world uh, in our, between our, both our river journey and ocean journey buildings. So if you've never been here, we definitely have uh, fish from everywhere. All over. All right. Uh, oh, this is a good question. So Jessica Collins, this is a, another question from Jahalen, wants to know why lemur eyes are so big? Lemurs have amazing large eyes. They uh, are kind of active all times of the day and night they can be. So those large eyes help them see in the dark rainforest. They also help them see a little bit better at night than maybe we could. Uh, so those large eyes are really important for them. He's up in the tree scent marking more. <laughs> All right, uh, Emma Grace, age six, uh, wants to know who was the first lemur at the Tennessee Aquarium? So they kind of all came in groups. So I believe we got Twix, Rolo, Sprite, and Snickers first, and they all came from Waco, Texas. So they came as a group. And then Gil, Skip, and Yoda all came from Lincoln, Nebraska. And then these guys came together from the South Carolina Aquarium. So they came together in groups. So there was not one lemur who arrived before everyone else. They are very social animals. Their group structures are very important to them. So they kind of like to be established in their groups that way. So my son, Henry, age four, would like to know how fast they can run on branches. That is a good question. And I don't know if there's actually any studies on particular speed that way, but I can tell you they're a lot quicker than I would be. Very balanced. Again, he's scent marking up there. But they can jump over six feet in height five to six feet in height, which is really impressive. So there you go, Henry. They can, they can move pretty quick. You can see them on the branch. They definitely run probably faster on branches than you or your sister would. Uh, Krista or Kirsta Rodian, uh, sorry, mispronounced it probably, but Orson wants to know how many types of lemurs there are in the world. So most lemurs and actually all lemurs can only be found on Madagascar and there are over a hundred different species. So. There is a big range that can only be found on that small island, which is really impressive. All right, now I'm not able to see this entire question, so you'll have to forgive me, but Jim Turrell is asking on behalf of 11-year-old Will, and this is really gonna put your lemur knowledge to the test, what is the difference between a red ruffed lemur and a white ruffed, right, white ruffed lemur other than, and I cannot see the rest of the comment, unfortunately, but what's, what's Other the difference? Other than the coloring is what I'm assuming. Probably. So there's black and white rough lemurs and there's white rough lemurs or red rough lemurs. So black and whites tend to actually be a little bit bigger. So black and white rough lemurs are the world's largest pollinating animal. So they are, but they're in the same genus. So they're both, they're scientific names. Uh, these guys are Varicia rubra and the black and whites are also in the genus Varicia. So they're in the same genus, but black and white roughs tend to be a lot larger. And by a lot, it's really not a lot, a lot larger, but they are bigger. That is the most specific question I think I've asked uh, probably in the course of these last year. That is a very good question. Uh, Christy Heron is back and wants to know, do you keep a vet on staff or do you use local vets for your animals? It's a weird hybrid I answer, actually. Hybrid answer. So Dr. Keller has his own private practice up on Signal Mountain, but he is also our staff vet. So he is here um, three days a week. He's here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and he's on call any other time we can need him. He often works weekends for us because... I'm sure most of you with animals know they don't wait to get sick or injured on a weekday. So Dr. Keller is on a call for us all the time, but he is on grounds three times a week just to double check everybody and keep up with things. And he does a very great job for us and we really appreciate his work. And that is still going on uh, even during the closure. So uh, yeah. again, again, I keep saying that emergency operations fund, uh, to which some of you have so generously donated, but that is specifically to pay for things like keeping our veterinarian coming to make sure that the animals are taken care of and looked after. Yeah. So contributing to that fund is, uh, is a great way to make sure that uh, you are supporting the aquarium. And if you can't, it's I keep saying this like it's like you have to donate. We have we definitely do not expect every, everybody to donate. But those of you who have been so generous to do, give donations, we sincerely appreciate it, and it really will go towards an excellent cause. And it looks like we're kind of running out of questions here, and that's probably okay because I feel like Josephine and Avery will probably like to have their uh, their exhibit back. But we do have one last question uh, again from Jessica yeah. Collins on behalf of Jahalen, who wants to know: Are lemurs 
night teenagers, and I think maybe nocturnal. Nocturnal? Um, they're kind of active all times of the day. So it really depend, varies species to species, but they're gonna be most active kind of in the cooler hours of the morning and the cooler hours of the evening. They nap a lot during the hotter hours of the day, um, but it kind of depends. So I can't answer that fully. Some species are fully nocturnal, such as the eye eye lemur, other species not so much. Um, Avior is showing off that grooming behavior, which is cute. And of course, now I said it, so he stopped. <laughs> I said his name. <laughs> All right. Well, that, uh, an uncooperative lemur, is probably an excellent place for us to stop this live stream. But I will say, as I usually do during these live streams, thank you very much for joining us, for watching, for your excellent questions. We really appreciate them. The donations, obviously, again, we really appreciate those. If you're interested in looking at any of our previous live streams, we do have them compiled on YouTube, and there's a link to that in our Aquarium at Home subsection of our main website, which is tnaqua.org. And there you will also find other activities that will help keep your kids uh, excited and stimulated and enriched, even if we want to use lingo from today's live stream. During the closure, we have things like activity sheets that you can print off. We have movies that you can watch. We have uh, educational videos that we ourselves have produced. So a lot of different resources available at tnaqa.org in our Aquarium at Home section. But for today, we will go ahead and wrap this up. Maggie, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through the world of lemurs and to help us wish happy birthday to the aquarium. Any day. All right. Well, we will end it there, guys. Thank you again so much for watching. We will see you again on Monday with another live stream. Check our Facebook page at about 11 o'clock to find out where that will be and when. And we will see you next time. Thanks again. And happy birthday to us.